Hello, everyone. Mic check, mic check. I don't hear the mic. Can everyone hear me? Well, you can hear me without a mic, probably. Mic's working? Okay, great. Welcome, everyone, again to the Peaceful Solution Character Education Teacher Certification class. If you're tuned in uh, on the internet over Facebook, and if you're standing here at the Peaceful Solution headquarters, you can be seated. And uh, if you're tuned in again online on Facebook, you can go ahead and go up to the top of our page and click the uh, where it says download the manual and you will find a list of manuals there. And the one we're working in right now is the third manual in this intermediate series, the self-control unit. And we're going to be picking up back on page well, tonight we'll be picking up on page 63, but of course, in every class, we always want to do a review of the prior class to kind of, you know, uh, refresh our mind. It's been three days, so we, we tend to lose a lot of the, the information. You know, we only retain a certain amount of it, so we're going to go back a little bit here. And I just want to do a quick review, if everybody could turn to page 61 and it talks about the question of the day it says why do we get angry and remember this chapter chapter 3 is control your anger now we get angry because we experience something that is unpleasant or our expectations aren't met and remember that a lot of people get people get angry for many different reasons and those reasons are called triggers and a trigger is something that causes something to take place. Um, a trigger could be a person, a situation, or an experience. And we learn that some people fall into what's called, you know, trigger or anger traps where, you know, a certain, a certain event or a certain person or a certain situation can consistently, or they'll consistently make wrong choices and they'll let their thoughts and emotions get away with them and they'll choose to become angry about situations you know it's kind of like getting into a rut you know like for instance somebody somebody does something to annoy you you start having negative thoughts you choose to get angry and then you you uh, respond in one of the three ways that we're going to learn about tonight which is called your anger style and if you don't learn the peaceful solution, you're going to keep making that same choice over and over and over again, you know, until you learn this information and how to get out of that trap. Remember, knowledge is power. Knowledge is power to avoid the traps. Okay, there's anger traps are one of the traps that we can avoid, along with the negative, uh, the negative influences, etc. So. Let's look at the first slide. If you could put the first visual up for me, please. yoo -hoo. First visual, there you go. Okay, so if you remember on page 61, there's some common reasons people get angry, okay, in these anger traps. It's called feeling a little insecure. Don't take everything so seriously. So insecurity, it says a common anger trigger lies in taking the random comments and actions of others as if they were intended to be personal. And this stems from one's own insecurities and issues involving self-worth. And you see the girl here probably looking at a comment made on the Facebook or some social media or possibly reading an email and somebody made a comment and it might not even been something, you know, that was meant to intended to be against her or but sometimes people, because of their insecurities that they feel inside about themselves, they're not sure about themselves, they're not sure about what they believe, they become, you know, they, they get angry. It can lead to anger. Their thoughts can lead to the feeling of embarrassment or, you know, frustration or whatever they feel. And then they, they can choose to become angry based on the thoughts they have. Or they can choose to have the cool thoughts and cool down and we're gonna learn about that also as we proceed in this chapter. Okay, so 
Um, that's on page 61, by the way, feeling a little insecure. It says, and it gave us the example that, you know, your friend comments on how much she dislikes watching comedies. You, however, like watching movies. An insecure person would think, you know, that just because your friend doesn't like the same movies you like or your taste in movies, that she doesn't like you. Well, that's, that's taking it to the extreme. But a secure person would understand that if someone doesn't like something you like, it doesn't mean they dislike you. Everyone's different, and they have different likes and dislikes. Remember what we learned in the character unit about personality. Everyone has different likes and dislikes, and that's okay. Our personalities can be different, and that makes the world interesting. But what should we have in common? What should we all share in common? Personality or character? Our character. Our character should all be, we should all be striving to have a perfectly moral character. Okay, that's what we should be striving for. And we should all have that in common, that same common goal. And then the next anger trap, let's look at the next slide, it was on page 62. And this is also called a trigger. It's called jumping to conclusions. And we learned um, that jumping to conclusions simply means arriving at a false belief due to a lack of accurate, truthful information. And of course, it, you know, we use the example of, you know, sometimes what you see or even what you hear might not, what it, might not be what it appears to be, and it might not be what you heard, okay? Sometimes we, you know, it could be kind of like, uh, kind of like you hear somebody talking over the phone and they're saying they have kids and they feed them grass and they make them sleep in the barn. Right? And you're like, man, I need to call CPS. This sounds like some kind of child abuse going on here. But if you'd have took the time to ask the person, they would have told you, oh, no, I was talking about my goats. We call them kids, you know? And yeah, they eat grass and they sleep in the barn. Right? So it could be something really just that simple, but sometimes we arrive at false conclusions or false beliefs because we don't get the accurate, truthful information. Okay, and then it says, uh, we sometimes make assumptions, second paragraph, based on insecurities about what we see and hear. For example, you see two of your friends at the water fountain. They're talking and laughing while looking in your direction. You think they're talking about and laughing at you, so we, you ignore them the rest of the day, which we're going to learn about tonight, one of, the, one of the anger styles. You ignore them the rest of the day, but if you had taken the time to gather the facts, you would have found out they were laughing at a funny poster that was tacked to the wall directly behind you. So remember, this is another common anger trap or a common trigger is jumping to conclusions. And tonight, we're going to pick up on page 63, which is entitled, Work It Out, Don't Fight It Out. Okay, but before we do that, I want to go back to our uh, LP3D, and we're going to look at number four, because we want to refresh our mind. We read this before, but we want to refresh our mind on the instruction, what we're trying to get across in this particular step of our procedure for this chapter. It says, instruct students to turn to page 61 and read the question of the day, which we did. Tell students that everyone has anger triggers. Although these triggers can vary from person to person, some are more common than others. Have students read and discuss the sections entitled Feeling a Little Insecure, Jump into Conclusions, which we have done, and now we're going to proceed to work it out, don't fight it out, found on page 63. Remind students that anger never resolves conflicts. Okay, Remember, the two wrongs don't make a right. I think Chris and Katan and David probably reminded you before in the past about uh, the author Israel Hawkins heard this from his father, you know, and, and I believe it's written in the foreword of one of these books where he said, you know, if he hadn't have heard his father say, son, two wrongs don't make a right, if that hadn't have been planted in his mind at an early age, you know, he might have fallen into these same, you know, traps that other people are falling into. But those few words, just that reminder, you know, that Two wrongs don't make a right. Getting even is not going to solve the problem. It made a huge difference in his life, and it makes a huge difference in the lives of everyone when they're reminded of these things 
and it's coupled with the teaching of the peaceful solution, which gives them and implants in them the self-control that they need to carry that out or carry out the thoughts that will lead to the peaceful feelings and the peaceful actions. So let's go ahead and look at page 63. Work it out, don't fight it out. And by the way, let me tell you, you know, that umpire standing, you notice he's got on a helmet, <laughs> or he's got a face guard, and he's got a chest protector. You know, it's not smart to get in between two people like that, you know? <laughs> kind of like, it's kind of like uh, two dogs are fighting, and you take, take them by the ears trying to keep them from biting each other. What do you think you're going to get? Well, they're probably going to bite you, right? So it's not very smart to get in the middle. <laughs> but now... When we get in the middle, when we become mediators, of the, when we're a peaceful solution mediator, doesn't physically mediate. You know, they don't get in between them and hey, hey, break it up. You know, what we do is we're we're preventive medicine. You know, we try to to educate people to behave in ways that won't even that won't start a conflict in the first place, like not to steal not to name call, not to tease, not to bully, to show that respect to everyone. So, but but if there is a problem, we don't take sides. What we do is we try to get both parties to see what the peaceful solution says and how they can resolve their difference, their conflict. Remember a conflict is a disagreement between one or more one or more people. And we try to show them how to resolve the conflict in a peaceful manner where nobody gets hurt or property gets damaged or the environment gets hurt in any way. So it says, another common anger trap lies in abusing in using abusive behavior as a means to resolve conflicts. Just because you have a conflict with someone does not mean you have to resort to verbal or physical abuse to get your point across. Conflicts are not excuses to become angry. Conflicts are simply disagreements between people with different opinions, different needs, and different wants. As you will learn in the next chapter, respectful communication and interaction as well as listening to each other can resolve any conflict a lot faster than anger ever could. Now, I want to ask you a question. I want you to go back in your memory here to when you were very young because you're going to have to do that right now because where did we get this idea that just because we have a conflict with somebody that we have to resort to verbally or physically abusing someone to get our point across? Well, we learned this at early ages, at a very early age, and, and one of the ways it was done was through the media, you know, whether it be cartoons on TV or whether it be comic books. I mean, even in the comic books, you know, I remember, I think I told you about the, the old Charles Atlas uh, bodybuilding uh, ad they had in every Archie and Veronica comic book, you know, on the back, you know, it'd have some guy sitting on the beach with his girlfriend and some bully came along and kicked sand in his face in front of his girlfriend and the skinny little wimpy guy was like, oh, he's all embarrassed, you know, because he got sand kicked in his face and everybody on the beach saw it, and, you know, this and that. So he thought, what can I do to get back at this bully? How can I retaliate against this guy? This guy's like, you know, six foot five and, you know, buff and everything else. What am I going to do? So he finds out about the Charles Atlas bodybuilding program, you know, and, uh, it shows, you know, he goes to the program. It shows six weeks later, you know, here he comes. You know, he's all buffed up like that guy that kicked the sand in his face. Then he sees him on the beach, that same guy that bullied him. He sees him on the beach, and he knocks him out. And his girlfriend's like, "Woo, you're my hero, right? Because he took the Charles Atlas bodybuilding course, you know? I mean, really, guys? Really? That that That's the way to handle situations like that? That's going to bring peace because I guarantee the guy that, you know, the guy that kicked his sand in his face originally, he's probably going to come back, right? You know, possibly he might bring a knife. Possibly he might bring a gun, right? Because 
he, the, the one guy might have won the battle, but the war, the war goes on. And that's the way it is in society out here. You know, uh, I think Chris mentioned we have a video that one of our Peaceful Solution instructors made because he was bullied in school up in Wisconsin. And it's called Tit for Tat. And it shows, I think we'll show it one night, possibly Chris or Katan or David can show it, but it's it shows the stupidity of retaliation and what it leads to and how it's so simple for an argument between a conflict between two people to escalate and escalate and escalate where eventually somebody pushes a button and we have a nuclear war, which, you know, who wins a nuclear war? <laughs> no one will win. You know, there's going to be devastating consequences for everyone, not just the two people that are going at it. Okay, so we've got to learn how to work it out, not fight it out. So we learn these things at an early age. And I'm going to show you one of the ways we learn it. And I'm not picking on this particular cartoon, but I'm going to show you one of the cartoons I grew up with that had a huge effect on my attitude, the way I perceived how to handle situations, etc., and I didn't even realize it was taking place. Let's go to this next visual. Okay, so Tom and Jerry, as an example, this is only one example of many I could have brought, but I want to, this is from Wikipedia. This is, this is a Wikipedia article, and I want you to listen to what the pertinent part says here. It says, Jerry's Jerry, Jerry's the mouse, okay? Tom is the cat. Now, that little mouse looks like a little pipsqueak, but, but listen to what Jerry was able to accomplish with this big cat in the cartoon. It says, Jerry's methods of retaliation are far more violent with frequent success, including slicing Tom in half, decapitating him, shutting his head or fingers in a window or a door, stuffing Tom's tail in a waffle iron or a mangle, kicking him into a refrigerator, getting him electrocuted, pounding him with a mace, club, or mallet, letting a tree or electric pole drive him into the ground, sticking matches into his feet and lighting them, tying him to a firework and setting it off, and so on. And this went on for 30 minutes. <laughs> this went back and forth, back and forth, between the cat and the mouse, back and forth for 30 minutes. 30 minutes of programming, okay? And I watched it. I think Tom and Jerry came on every day after school. And that's just one of many cartoons. How else did we have these things planted in our mind at a very early age that we have to resort to it? When we have a conflict, we have to resort to verbal or physical abuse to get our point across. Okay, cartoons, the media was only one example. Let's look at the next example, the next visual. Okay, we had, you know, from a very early age, we had the boys had our G.I. Joes, right? <laughs> we had our G.I. Joes. I had hundreds of them, I think. I used to stand them all up and knock them all down, pretending, you know, I was in a war, and, you know, then I'd stand them back up again, you know. I mean, all day long, you know, with the G.I. Joes, and then we had the, I know my parents used to buy us the model airplanes, the fighter planes that we would put together with the glue. And, uh, and of course, you know, not just these kind of toys when you're young, but as you get a little bit older in your teen years, you start to use that Xbox, right? And what do they have to offer on the Xbox? You know, we went through a lot of these things in the character unit. We talked about a lot of these influences, you know. Uh, for the most part, what are they doing on these Xboxes? Are they playing peaceful games that teach them how to resolve conflicts in a peaceful manner? You know, like peace building, you know, I guess uh, diplomacy games, you know, where they're all sitting around a table in the video and they're all discussing how they can solve this problem without anybody getting hurt. That's what they're doing? Yes or no? No. What they're doing is they're learning how to blow things up, how to decapitate people, how to shoot people. They're learning the art of war. They're learning the art of war. 
they're learning the way of war, okay? Because when you pick up a, I don't care if you pick up a, you're using a joystick. I don't know why they call it. That's a false thing right there, a joystick. <laughs> Joy as you, as you murder, destroy, cause mayhem and damage, right? That's a joystick. <laughs> so they're putting in your mind that that's, you know, and think about it, that same joystick, put that Xbox back up for a moment, please. Actually, that one's got a, a little bit of a different uh, thing on it, but the joystick that I remember when I was growing up had an actual little stick that stuck up there and you would move it around, kind of like a, a stick shift on a car. You know, do you know that that's the same device they have on these uh, these uh, the guys that control drones for the military? You know, a guy could be sitting 2,000, 3,000 miles away, and he's got a drone up there looking for somebody that he wants to kill, that he wants to murder in a war, and he can actually, with that drone sitting 3,000 miles away in a little room somewhere like he's playing a video game, that drone can zero in on that person that he wants to destroy, that he wants to murder, that he wants to wipe off the face of the earth, and with the push of that button, just like he does on the video game, that person's life can be zapped out. Their car destroyed, you know, those things are pretty accurate. But the guy that's playing, it's like to him, it's like playing a video game. It's not, there's nothing to it. He just, he just guides the drone and he pushes the button and boom, the life is zapped out. He doesn't even have to see the blood. He doesn't have to see anything. Makes it simple, I guess. Is it so simple? Have you ever seen a scene where he had, uh, I've seen scenes of, uh, uh, what do you call them, uh, suicide bombers, you know, like in Israel. We have the conflict with Israel and Palestine. I've seen pictures of suicide bombings, real pictures. You know, we only hear on the evening news, you know, the, the major networks, they don't show what really occurs. You only hear or read about, you know, suicide bombing kills 10 people. But they don't show you the real face of what it looks like, like the limbs, the arms, the head, all the body parts everywhere, all over the place. They don't show you that. They don't show you what it actually does, the shrapnel and how it comes out and there's nails sticking in people and, you know, whatever things that they put in those in those bombs that they strap on somebody, that somebody actually straps on themselves because somebody's convinced them that war is the answer, that how to resolve your differences is go, go, go destroy yourself and destroy your enemy over there. Just strap that bomb on. And we have young children that do this in many countries that are taught to do this. They're taught to kill their enemy at a very young age. Now, we're taught the same thing, so don't start going, you know, don't start thinking too highly of ourselves here. We're taught the same thing. We just don't actually carry it out, you know, physically, but we're carrying it out in the video games. When we play the point-and-shoot games, when we use the joystick to destroy, I hate to call it a joystick, it's, a, it's really a, not the right term. But remember, I'm, I'm talking about things that we've grown up with that have been put in our minds from a very young age that have actually solidified in our minds that war or fighting back retaliation is the way to resolve our conflicts that we have with somebody in fact i remember uh, when they the vietnam the vietnam war they actually called it the vietnam conflict i don't know why they called it a conflict they confused war with conflict a conflict is simply a disagreement between two parties a war is an absence of self-control between two parties where they go into a rage and they just start destroying everything. So there's a difference between a conflict and a war. Okay, now let's look at the next visual because I want you to understand something that we learned uh, in uh, the character unit. These, they call these TV programs, you know, Tom and Jerry, or any of the other TV programming that we're watching. This violent programming 
is being programmed into our mind and heart. It enters in through our eyes, our ears. Those are the ports. Those are the those are the ports of entry that the influences come through. And it's downloaded into our brain. Okay? It's taken into our brain and into our heart. Okay, now, we might not even realize, what I want you to understand is, when we're watching these things, it's not like we're sitting there thinking, you know, okay, I'm programming myself, you know, to be a, to get even, or I'm programming myself, you know, to have a certain attitude about, you know, we're not even thinking about it. We're just enjoying what we're seeing. We're just thinking it's entertainment. It's harmless. We're not thinking there's anything going on, but we are being programmed. Your brain is a computer. Your brain is the most powerful. Your brain is more powerful than thousands of computers, thousands of the most powerful supercomputers that you could ever imagine. Okay. Your brain is more can store more information is more powerful than anything mankind can even dream of. Okay? And that information is being downloaded. It's downloading. Now, guess what? Look at the next visual. Do you remember what we learned on page 65 of the character unit? Once it's downloaded, once it's taken in at a very young age or even as a teenager or even as an adult, it becomes a part of the subconscious mind. I remember one of the first classes we did in the certification, Chris showed a picture of how subtle influences are. Remember, and he showed that picture of the iceberg and how, you know, something can look really small. The iceberg looks really, really small, but when you look underneath the water, when you go underneath, you see the iceberg is actually probably 90% bigger than you actually see on the surface. Well, the subconscious mind is the same thing. We only consciously use about 10% of our mind. The other 90% called the subconscious mind that's underneath, all this information is being stored away in there. Everything that we see, everything that we hear, everything we experience, Everything even our mother experienced when we were in our mother's womb is in our subconscious mind. You know, the author of The Peaceful Solution said you can take a book. You can take a book and you can just flip through it like I'm flipping through this book right here, just like this. And I'm just glancing at the page. I don't have to read the page. I can just, if I, my peripheral vision hits that page, you know what I just did? I'm down, my, my subconscious mind is taking a picture of every page I'm looking at. Every little word on this page, every picture, every little, every little dot of an eye and everything is being downloaded into my subconscious mind. Now, I'm not telling you a way to cheat, you know, where you, you, you remember, you can't use it. You can't, you're not going to be able to, to just pull it up at will, you know. So you can't say, yeah, I read a book in one minute, you know. Well, it's not going to work. You're not going to remember it all. But your subconscious mind is going to remember every bit of it. Okay? And you all know as well as I do, you can close your eyes right now, and you don't even have to close your eyes. And you can think of any movie you've ever seen or any song you've ever heard or anything you've ever done, and you can sit there and you can live it again in your mind. You can... Uh, you can even see, you know, in Scarface, you know, he's standing there in the movie Scarface, Al Pacino, you know, he's standing there and, you know, he's standing on the balcony, you know, and he's like, I'm Tony Montana, you know, and, and there are 200 bullets are ripping through him, you know, and he's, he's all like standing there, you know, because he's all high on cocaine and his body's all, you know, he's all worked up and jacked up and he's taking 200 bullets into his body and he's still talking. He's still talking, you know, he's, he's. He's, you know, these bu these bullets are ripping through his body, but he's still talking, you know. In Hollywood, you can do that. You can keep talking, you know, even though there's 200 bullets, you know, just strafing through your body. How many bullets do you think it would have really taken to take him down? <laughs> Hollywood has a really strange way of impressing things in your mind, you know, where they made you think that, 
you know, this is some kind of hero, man. Look at this guy. He's a hero, you know? No? No, it only took one it only took one bullet to take him down. Okay? But these are the kind of impressions they put in your mind and you know, you don't forget them. They make it so so believable and so real in your mind, you know? These these scenes they show you, you know, of these violent of violence. Because they want you to remember, you know. There's somebody that wants us to remember. <laughs> okay? Um, I don't know if we ever kind of got into it in the... Uh, but we will, I think, later on in this unit. Another peaceful solution a little later on. Um, about how, you know, the military, the Pentagon and Hollywood have a... I'll scratch your back, you scratch mine type of relationship. Did you know that... Uh, did you know that uh, Hollywood producers have offices in the Pentagon, the War Department in, uh, in Maryland there? And did you know that they're actually able to use the Pentagon will allow them to use military equipment in exchange for, you know, hey, let us look at the movie script and approve of it and make sure you make the military look really great, you know. Make sure, you know, you make the military look glorious. Make sure you look make war look glorious. We don't want it to be a downer to people. We want them to think war is a great thing because we want people to join up. They're looking for recruits, right? Now, go back to that gun or that G.I. Joe or that, you know, uh, the uh, Xbox or whatever we were playing when we were young. Somebody was trying to program us because they need fighters, <laughs> plain and simple. And if you don't believe me, you can go on the internet right now and you can look up the Hasbro Toy Company, just as an example, and you can find out that way back in the 40s, they were looking for, you know, they needed people to fight because not everyone wants to join the military. You know, there's a built-in aversion, remember, to killing your own kind. Even little children know you don't pick up a, uh, a pencil and start stabbing your friend because you know he got in your you know he got in your lunchbox or something you know they know better than that so people have to be programmed to kill programmed to want to destroy and the toy companies made a deal with the military planners and they started making cap guns and you know little little cap guns for children to play with and they started selling them in the toy stores and parents started buying them. They didn't really know what it led to. They didn't understand what it would lead to putting a toy gun in their child's hand. They didn't understand. But they understood when their boy got older and they saw him with a real gun in his hand and they said, hey, what are you doing with that gun? Put that thing down. Well, what's wrong, mom? <laughs> Been using this thing since I was knee high to a grasshopper. Yeah, but that's a real one. <laughs> yeah? Let me ask you this. And I ask parents this. Uh, this is something I ask them because I want them to really visualize. We don't think there's anything wrong with putting a toy gun in someone's hand. But what if your child, what if you walked in your house and your child was sitting there with all of his friends around the dining room table and they had a, they had a toy bong, you know, and they were all sitting there passing it around, pretending they were getting high on cocaine, you know, on a, What's that called? Crack? And they had a little piece of paper, a white piece of paper, and they put it in the pipe, and they were all passing it around. We're just playing, Mom. What, what, what's wrong? We're just playing. Do you think a parent would like to see that? Oh, no, they would not. They would, they, would, they would be very upset, and I'm sure that they would scold their children and the children that were all doing that. But what's the difference between putting a gun in their hand, a toy gun, or a toy bong? It's all wrong. Hey, we could make a song. Bong, wrong, song. Right? We could write a song for the peaceful solution. Have we got any songwriters here? Oh, great. Okay. But think about it. Think about, think about how we don't stop and think about the end result of what we do with our children, what we put in their hand or what we let them see or what we let them play with. 
the only way you're going to understand this, the only way any of us can understand this is through education, like we're getting right now. If if someone doesn't bring this to our attention, we're never going to understand. We're never going to think. We're never going to think much of it. Okay, in other words. And uh, I remember once. Uh, uh, I think I told you. I, I I tell a lot of little stories, so I'm not really sure if you if you, you you might not remember it. I don't even remember if I told you, so I'll tell you again. But uh, there was a mom once that came to the Peaceful Solution, and she had a four year old in uh, preschool. And she said, you know, my, my four-year-old is biting people and hitting them and stuff in class. Do you think you can help my child? And I'm like, well, sure, you know. And so the mom brought her in. And uh, it didn't take me five minutes to figure out what was going on. And I'm not, you know, I don't blame the mom because the mom didn't know until somebody just simply pointed out something that was taking place. Well, what I noticed was the little child came up and pinched her or did something to her. And the mom hit her and pinched her back and said, don't you ever pinch me again. And I, and I just kind of looked at the mom and I said, did you notice what you just did? And she goes, what? And I said, you just pinched her and you hit her and you told her not to hit you. She goes, I did? <laughs> you know, that, that second, it was like a frying pan moment to her. She's like, you're right. I did do that. <laughs> I said, well, you know, that might be where she's getting it. And she agreed that had been going on a long time in their house. So she promised that she would start working on not doing that. So her and teaching her daughter not to do the same. But you know what? If somebody had not appointed out that little thing, it's just a little thing. She would have never thought about it. And that's the way education works. Remember, it enlightens the mind. It, 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 it illuminates the dark areas, you know, that, we're, that we don't understand or that we're in darkness in. And we, we're, we're looking for answers, you know. We're like kind of just groping around, you know, looking for the light switch. We don't really know why we're in this rut. We don't understand what's making us tick. We don't understand why we get angry. We don't understand why we lash out. We don't understand. We just think it's normal that, you know, well, that's what you need to do. I just had a student tell me earlier today, you know, well, that's just when I when I get angry or when somebody upsets me, I get angry and then I go find a bottle of booze because that's what I do when I get angry. That's what I've always done. I just think it's normal to do that. I said, well, we got to stop thinking it's normal to do that. Now we got to now that we know it's not normal to do that. Now we need to start thinking, what else can we do when we choose to get angry what else can we do what else could we do besides grabbing that bottle of booze and it's really just as simple as that it's learning the steps learning the techniques and learning this information that enlightens us and helps us to make better choices so let's look now at straight talk and can you put up the next visual so everyone can read this it says don't use anger as a way to shield yourself from having to deal with some of your true feelings. Many people respond with anger rather than expressing their emotions, such as feeling hurt, disappointed, or afraid. By the way, those are called what? Those are called emotions. Hurt, disappointed, afraid. Those are primary emotions. Those are primary emotions, okay? It's okay to feel those. OK, but we need to deal with them and express them in appropriate ways. OK, anger is not a shield to hide behind. It's OK to calmly express some of your other feelings. Um, I had a, a student in Zapata, Texas, and uh, it was a couple. Actually, it was a couple. And uh, one day. The wife called and said, my husband's not coming to anger management class tonight. He's very upset with me. And I'm like, oh, okay. Well, what's he upset about? She said, I got a job. And I'm like, you got a job? I thought he said something about y'all needed more money or something. He's upset that you got a job? She said, she said, yeah. And I thought, well, that sounds kind of strange. Now, being an instructor in the Peaceful Solution, I also understand that you got to get both sides of the story. You know, I'm only hearing one side. But... When I called the husband, I no, actually, 
after, before I called the husband, she had told me that, that I said, well, where did you get a job at? She said, well, I got a job at a convenience store. I said, oh, a convenience store. She goes, yeah, I'll be working from like midnight to seven in the morning. I'm like, oh, okay. And now we're getting somewhere, <laughs> right? Now we're getting somewhere because if I was a husband and my wife came home and said, uh, honey, I'm going to be working the night shift at a convenience store, you know, like a, one of these convenience stores where all kinds of different people come at night, right? Most people that are up at three, you know, I'm not saying, you know, the truck drivers, you know, they're out 24 hours or truck drivers, you know, the great guys, man, they, they move our, they move all of our stuff around, you know, we need them truck drivers. But there's a lot of other things that come out at night. You know, the cockroaches come out of the woodwork at night. When you go in some of these convenience stores, you'll know what I'm talking about. Don't go at two in the morning, okay? I'm telling you, don't go. But if you're if you are there at two in the morning, you'll see what comes out. A lot of drug dealers and drug users and drunks and things come out, and they're hanging out at the convenience store. So I'm thinking now. If I was her husband, how would I feel that my wife was going to be working from midnight to seven in a convenience store in the middle of nowhere? How would I feel? Yell it out if you know how I would feel. Excuse me? Angry? No, no. What would my primary emotion be when I first heard? Yeah, I'd be afraid. I'd be afraid. I'd be afraid. I'd be afraid for who? My wife, I'd be afraid for her. I'd be afraid for her safety. I'd be afraid for her safety. And I'd be afraid that because a lot of bad things could occur to my wife if she was working that late at night at a convenience store. So I would be afraid. But you know what? In the culture that I was teaching in, in the Spanish culture, men have been taught, you you don't cry, you know. You don't, you don't sh you know, you don't let them know you're real. You know, you hide behind the anger. Put that anger shield back up, please. You see that shield? Instead of expressing my true feelings like, wow, honey, I'm, you know, I'm really very afraid that you're going to be working at that convenience store, you know, that late at night. I mean, there's, that's dangerous. Those places get robbed and people come in there and there's all kinds of riffraff going on. Now, you know, I'm very afraid for you. Oh, no, 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 we can't do that. We got to hide behind the anger shield, right, and say, you ain't working nowhere. <laughs> right? Because that's what we've been taught to do. Rather than just expressing our true feelings, right, we got to put on the machismo, the macho man. We got to stand behind the anger shield and say, no, you ain't getting no job. You don't need no job. Right? And that's what took place. Okay? I understand that now. You understand that now. He understood that later after when we had, he actually came to class that night because I called him and we talked and I understood how he felt. I would have felt the same way. I just wouldn't have reacted the same way, hopefully, because I've been taught the peaceful solution. So I would know, okay, if I feel afraid, I need to just tell her I feel afraid, not ha hide behind that anger shield and use anger as a shield to hide behind. Okay, and that's what this is showing us. Don't use it as a shield. You know, work it out. You know, go to the person that you're upset with, you know, that might have embarrassed you or might have frustrated or annoyed you or whatever feeling, you know, that you had and work it out the right way instead of hiding behind anger because that's not going to you know, all that's going to do is create a conflict, a bigger conflict, like we saw with the man and the woman. And they did learn. I mean, that's it's a great thing that they had the peaceful solution in their life. And, and the woman actually didn't go to work. She didn't go to work at that place. OK, because she saw once her husband pointed out to her the danger of it. And once I talked to her about it and we had a class and we all discussed it. She said, you know, you're right. I never really thought much about that. And I never really thought that my husband would react that way. But now I understand he really did it out of care and concern. He just didn't know how to express it because he hadn't been taught about what we're learning right now. So she appreciated that. 
even though she didn't appreciate how he first reacted to it, right? So it's okay to ex calmly express some of your other feelings, guys. Okay, guys, you know, we can be we can be human. We have feelings. We don't have to, you know, put on the macho man deal, you know. We don't have to, you know, you can cry. Grown men can cry, okay? We can express feelings. We can we can let them know how we feel. Keep in mind that these are just some common anger triggers. Um, there are as many different anger triggers as there are people. It's up to you to discover your anger triggers in order to control your anger. Okay, so let's turn now back to LP3D uh, and look at instruction five. It says, instruct students to turn to page 64 and read the section entitled Anger Sequence. Have students learn their anger cues and complete the self-evaluation on page 64 through 68. They will summarize the evaluation on page 69. So let's go ahead and turn to page 64. We're not going to get through all of this tonight. Um, Gatan will have to, to pick up next class and cover more here. But let's get started because we still have a few minutes left. And look at anger sequence. Now, you know what a sequence is. A sequence is, you know, uh, uh, it's an order of events that take place after something takes place. So let's look here. It says, whether we realize it or not, there's a series of steps that lead to feeling angry. These steps involve our anger triggers, thoughts, and feelings. In learning to control your anger, you must be aware of all the steps that lead to anger. What do you mean there's steps that lead to anger? <laughs> It's immediate, isn't it? Your steps that lead to anger? Man, I got angry right away. It only took two seconds, right? <laughs> well, guess what? No, there is steps. And once you learn the steps, it's very important that you know each step so you can learn how to cut it off at step one or step two, actually. You won't be able to you won't be able to cut off step one because triggers come in all shapes, forms, and sizes, right? A trigger can be an experience, a person, etc. You can't stop the test from coming, can you? Unless you go hide, even if you go hide in the Himalayan mountains, you know, you're going to get tested. Bigfoot will be up there or something. I don't know, you know. You know? Somebody will be up there to test you, okay? I think they call it a Yeti, right? The Yeti will be up there. Maybe the Dalai Lama will be hiding up there somewhere or something. But somebody's going to be there, okay? Even your own mind. Remember, conflicts can start in our own brain, right? We can have a conflict with ourselves and start arguing with ourselves. <laughs> so we can't keep the trigger from occurring. We can't, we can't stop that. But we can stop it at step two. And that's what we're going to learn. So let's look at step one. Anger starts with an incident that pushes our buttons and triggers our anger. Conflicts, disagreements, insecurities, and disappointments are examples of common triggers. What are your anger triggers? So you're going to ask your students to list at least three, and they probably might not be able to list three, but at least get one out of them. You know, that'd be a great first start. Get, get, ask them to think of something that triggers based on what they've learned already here that we just went over in the last few pages. Ask them a common thing that trips their trigger, so to speak. The second step is hot thoughts. What you say to yourself when faced with one of your anger triggers determines whether you become angry. Thoughts like, how would she like it if I did that to her? Or, he makes me so mad I could smack him. Those are called hot thoughts because they fuel your anger and make you feel you have the right to be angry and to act on your anger. Using any of those three triggers we listed in question one, write what thoughts you would typically have when faced with one of these triggers. Now, a lot of times when I ask that question to students, they won't tell me their thoughts. They'll tell me what they do or what they say. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Not what you say. Tell me what you're thinking before you say it. Make sure they understand that you're saying, no, what are your thoughts? What thoughts are going through your mind? normally when something like that takes place. Make sure they're not telling you what they would say or do. Make sure they're, they're understanding that you want to know what kind of thoughts are going through their mind, what kind of hot thoughts. And 
And you'll and once they understand that, they'll probably tell you a thing or two, and hopefully that'll be rated G, you know. Um, number three, third step is feelings. Our thoughts produce our feelings. Therefore, hot thoughts justify our choice to feel angry. Remember, our feelings affect us both mentally and physically. Angry feelings can cause physical changes like an increase in heart rate, headaches, and stomach aches. Angry feelings also lead to irrational thoughts that intensify these physical changes. Anger creates a vicious cycle which, if left unchecked, will lead to violence. That's why it's so important to pay attention to those very first physical changes that accompany anger. The physical changes you experience when you're angry are called anger cues. You know, think about, think about a, a, I'm sure you've watched like how they make a movie, like how they make movies. They have what's called cue cards. A cue card tells the actor you know, it says, okay, now walk in the door, walk into the door, look at her and say, hi, honey, I'm home. Right? It's written on a card. It's called a cue card. And all they have to do is look at the card and follow what the card says and do what the card says. It's called a cue card. Well, a cue in this case is what am I, what kind of physical feelings am I like what kind of physical changes are going on in my body right now? And I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna read you some anger cues here, so you can see what it's talking about. When you recognize and listen to what your body's telling you, that's your cue to start practicing self control. In other words, it's like somebody's holding up a cue card and saying, "All right, you feel this, you feel this coming on." So hey hey hey, whoa whoa whoa, self control. Remember self control. Remember what you learned in the peaceful solution. Take the following self-evaluation. Check all the cues that apply to you. So here's some common anger cues. Your heart beats faster. You can actually hear it pounding. Your body temperature changes. You feel really hot or cold. You start speaking faster. You start speaking louder. You start to tremble or shake. You breathe faster. Your face gets flushed. You're cl you clench your fists, you grit your teeth, you get an upset stomach. Now, you might not experience any of those, or you might experience multiple ones. Do you have any other anger cues that are not listed there? You know, ask your students, is there something else you feel physically when you know you're beginning to become angry? You know, they need to recognize these things so they can understand the steps, so they can understand that, hey, even if I went past step two and I didn't practice self-control yet because I let my thoughts, my, my thoughts stayed hot, even when you get to step three and you start to feel, you know, uh, these, these feelings, you can still cut it off. You can still recognize, hey, whoa, whoa, anger cue. It says, you know, the cue is control yourself. You can recognize that and say, okay, I need to, I need to stop, think, you know, Weigh out my options. Let Stop, first of all, and just calm down, right? Let my emotion pass before I say or do anything. And that might take a while, you know, however long it takes to calm down. All right, flip the page over. So the next step, um, and I'm going to go, go ahead and put up that last visual. I want everyone to look at these anger styles as we're reading this. The next step, step four, is behavior. Uncontrolled anger can lead to rage and even violent behavior. The typical angry person might have one of the following three responses, withdrawal, displacement, or attack. To withdraw means to ignore the source of the anger. People who withdraw either pretend they're not angry or they hold their anger in. They give others what is commonly known as the silent treatment, as you see on the left. Okay, you know, the person, uh, you know, got his arms crossed and he's looking the other way and you don't want to talk to that person. Okay, he's not saying anything. That's called withdrawal. That's, a, that's the anger style of withdrawal. People who withdraw stew in their anger. Eventually, people who withdraw reach their breaking point where their anger erupts, causing harm to themselves or to others. 
Studies show that holding on to anger actually weakens the immune system, making the body the body vulnerable to disease. Okay? So, you know, I've had people actually tell me, and I want you to get this because you remember you're dealing with junior high students here. I've had people, I've had grown adults actually tell me, oh, I control my anger fine. You know, I, I, I control it fine when people do things. I just don't say anything, you know. And I'm like, okay, you don't say anything, but what are you thinking? Well, I just keep my thoughts to myself. I just don't say anything. Yeah, but are they negative thoughts? Yeah, but I don't say anything. Isn't that controlling it? <laughs> no. Withdrawing, if you notice on the bottom, that's called uncontrolled anger. <laughs> These anger styles we're looking at, this isn't controlling your anger. Even if you keep it in and you hold it in, that's not controlling it. That's not managing your anger. That's called holding on to a grudge, <laughs> right? That's like holding on and bottling up resentment. And eventually, what do you think is going to take place? It's going to erupt. Not, not only that, it's showing us here that we're weakening our immune system. You know, the system that's in everyone's body that helps to keep them from feeling getting sick and weakening their organs and even their mind. Okay, this can cause deterioration of the mind when you hold anger in like that. It can deteriorate your mind. It can degenerate it, just like it does your organs. Now, the second, the second anger style, it says attacking. Attacking when angry results in physical and verbal abuse. Physical abuse includes hitting, kicking, slamming objects, or pushing people. Verbal abuse includes yelling, vulgar language, saying cruel things that would put down and hurt the life and well-being of the other person. Now, I had, when I was young, I had a problem with anger, and I would, I would, uh, I would come into my second grade class. My second grade teacher was so, I mean, I, I would come into class and just throw everyone's books on the ground off their desk because I was angry. I didn't know why I was angry. I didn't know, I didn't know what was wrong. And my teacher told me, you know what, if you can stop doing that for one week, I'm going to take you to the circus after uh, school's out. And I did. For a whole week, I stopped doing it, and I went to the circus with my teacher. My teacher actually, you know, gave me that reward. But that's what I would do. I would just attack, okay? And I didn't know why. Okay, but that's not the proper way. That's called uncontrolled anger, okay? Attacking. And you don't, but the point I'm trying to make is you don't have to attack a person. You can just start throwing books off people's desks. You know, you can, you can punch your, you can punch your fist through a wall and you can say, well, at least I didn't hit anybody, you know? And, you know, I went to a psychiatrist and the psychiatrist told me, you know, when you get angry, just hit your pillow, you know, go in your room and hit your pillow. Don't, don't, don't hit anybody. Don't. Was that wise? This guy had a. This guy, this, this doctor had a, he had a degree in psychology. He had some kind of master's or something, right? He told me to go ahead and hit the pillow instead of hit somebody else. Is that the answer? No, because I'm still hitting. I'm still hitting something. I'm still using the attack, right? No, don't hit anything. Learn how to control. Remember, it's uncontrolled anger when we attack verbally or physically, people or objects. Now, another type of response involves displacing your anger. This means taking out your anger or frustration on people or inanimate objects that are not directly connected to the incident that you're angry about. For example, you're upset with your friend because you felt left out. You yelled at your... Okay. For example, you're upset with your friend because he didn't invite you to his house, but instead of telling him that you felt left out, you yelled at your little brother when he tried to talk to you. Or you can do what I did when I got upset with my mom. No, don't do this. Hold on, man. No, this is what I used to do, okay? If I got upset with my mom, I would find her cat, and I would sit on the cat or something, and the cat would be like, meow, meow. And my mom would be like, Willie, get off that cat! You know, because I would take my anger out on the cat, because I knew my mom loved that cat, so I knew how to get to my mom, right? Don't do that, but that's what I used to do, okay? Taking it out on animals or inanimate objects or something else, right? But instead of telling him you felt left out, you yelled at your little brother. 
All three of these responses are examples of anger that is uncontrolled. Uncontrolled anger leads to resentment, hate, and retaliation. Notice it doesn't lead to any peaceful resolution of a problem. So I want you to remember what we went over tonight about these anger sequence, okay, and also what we work it out, don't fight it out. Remember, retaliation is never an option for a peaceful solution, character education program student, right? You've been a great class tonight. Uh, the next class will be on 417 at 5.30 p.m. Uh, please join us. Uh, Katan will be the next teacher. We hope to see you all there. Remember, practice a peaceful solution. It works, right? We'll see you next time.